So we are in chapter 13 of the Westminster Confession of Faith. We're going to be looking at sanctifi sanctification. Uh, remember, so there's a, a whole process of what's going on in the, in the chapter. Remember, if you look at the table of contents, that reveals a lot about uh, the, frame, the framework for, this, uh, for the confession. And so sanctification rightly follows justification and adoption, and we're going to see uh, why that's important. Uh, and actually, that's all part of what's called the economy of redemption. Have you ever heard that phrase, economy of redemption? I, I didn't think so. It's, that's, very, uh, that's very much a theological term. That's, that's what a lot of scholars like to use that. Um, essentially, what the, so the word economy, it's a Greek word. It comes from the Greek, uh, oikonomia. Uh, and uh, so we, we hear there's you know, economy. That's where we get it from. Uh, and, and, it, and that word means uh, the management of or the system of something. Uh, so, so that's why, that's why we, we might use that word economy. We use it with economics with those things because that's like a system of commerce, the management of commerce. But the word economy we can use in a, in a various way. So for instance, we do say the economy of redemption. When we say that, we're talking about the system of redemption. You've probably heard the plan of redemption uh, or the plan of salvation. If you grew up in the Baptist church, you've probably heard about that. That's what we're talking about here. Uh, I just use the economy of redemption because if I say plan of salvation, that's actually a very specific thing that, again, many, many Baptists have in view. That's, that's what they're saying. When I say economy of redemption, I'm speaking from a Reformed perspective, and we'll, we'll unpack what that is in a moment. Um, so when we're speaking about the economy of redemption, we're talking about what happens within that system, within that system of redemption. And guess what? It's actually Trinitarian. There should be no surprise there that that work is Trinitarian. Um, the Father initiates redemption. So it's God who calls, God who, who chooses, God who elects, God who adopts. So it's God who is doing these things. The Son accomplishes redemption. So he's our mediator. We've talked about that before. His righteousness is imputed onto believers, onto the elect. So it's the Son who does the accomplishing of redemption. And the Spirit applies redemption. And the Spirit is the one who, um, who, who, who does our adopting. Actually, it's through the Spirit that we're adopted. It's through the Spirit that we're sanctified. It's through the Spirit that we are, are renewed and transformed. Uh, and, so this is, and so we see how all three are participants, uh, all three of the Godhead are participants in our redemption. So the doctrine of sanctification falls under the application of of redemption, which is, of course, by the Holy Spirit. And there's a reason why it's called the Holy Spirit. We call it the Spirit, and in multiple times in the, in the scriptures, you'll see God's Spirit or Christ's Spirit. It's all the same Spirit, but when we you know, say our Apostles' Creed and other things, we, we talk about the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Uh, the reason why it's holy is because that word holy tells us about the work of the Spirit, that it's part of our sanctification. So, of course, sanctification actually shares the same root word as the word holy. So we talked about sanctifying. Uh, something is, is sanct or sacred in that sense. The word holy means to set apart or to consecrate, or specifically, the word sanctification means to make holy. So you see how these words are related here. And so the Holy Spirit then is making us holy. And that's the, the process of sanctification or the doctrine of sanctification, the process by which a person becomes holy. And that's what we're going to study here in these three articles. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll get through it. Uh, first off, I'm, I'm going to do again, I think that expository style sort of worked last time, so I'm going to do very similar We'll read the article and then I'll sort of parse out the various phrases. So article one, I've sort of titled this the, the practice of true holiness. They who are once effectually called and regenerated, having a new heart and a new spirit created in them, are further sanctified really and personally through the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection by his word and spirit dwelling in them. The dominion of the whole body of sin is destroyed, and the several lusts thereof are more and more weakened and mortified, and they more and more quickened and strengthened in all saving graces to the practice of true holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. 
So the process of, of sanctification, excuse me, happens to those, quote, effectually called and regenerated. So that's who, that's who, are, who becomes sanctified. Romans 8.30 is the basis for this. And of course, Romans 8.29 and 30 give to us the golden chain of salvation. There, Paul says, those whom he predestined, so those whom God predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And so you see the process there. Predestination, calling, justification, glorification. So that's the golden chain of salvation. Um, and so sanctification and glorification are, are very similar. They're, they're, they're one in the same, uh, in the sense that we become sanctified so that we will be glorified in heaven. And so sanctification happens then only to the elect, only to the regenerated, only to the justified. Uh, you can't be sanctified if you are not a believer, if you're not a Christian. Uh, holiness is not achieved by anyone who is not counted or chosen by sovereign grace. That's what that first phrase lets us know. Now, regeneration doesn't actually have its own chapter in the Westminster Confession, which is a bit interesting because it, it is an important um, topic, but for some reason, the, the framers didn't, uh, didn't devote a special chapter to re regeneration, but rather it's been sort of interspersed throughout various chapters. So I want to talk a little bit about regeneration. Um, it's concurrent, if you will, with justification and adoption in a temporal sense. Now, I say in a temporal sense because there's a logical order to salvation, okay? That order, that, and I'll, I'll write on the board so you can see it, that order is logical, but it's not temporal, okay? So let me, let me, let me just explain. Let me write it up on the board. I'll make sure I get it in the right order. I'm just going to take this over here. So here we have, so the first is, uh, is the effectual calling. I'm just going to put it calling. And then there's regeneration. Then there's faith. Then there's justification. Sanctification. And glorification. So that's the reformed understanding of the order of redemption, or the the, the logic, the logical order of redemption. Those who are so there's the effectual calling. God calls a person. Uh, we would also call this election. So God elects a person. God uh, gr pours His grace. His He has mercy on whom He has mercies, and He calls forth a person. Uh, effectually into, into saving faith. And so what that person does is when they receive that call, they are regenerated. They receive regeneration. Now regeneration, we, I've mentioned this word before, this is essentially being born again. Um, so when, when Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must be born of the Spirit, that's the doctrine of regeneration. So a person is called and that person is then regenerated. So calling comes first and then regeneration in the logical order. After regeneration comes faith. So once, so, and this actually is a big debate between you know, Calvinists and Arminians and other theologians. Um, some say faith comes before regeneration, but the Reformed perspective says it's all part of God's work, and this is also, you know, faith is a gift from God, and a person cannot have faith unless they are born again. Uh, because uh, you know, if you had faith, before you were born again, then why, why do we need to even be born again? Because you have faith. That's, and that's the, the logic. So, that's what, so again, the Reformed perspective, there's the effectual calling of that person who's called is regenerated, that person who's regenerated is given saving faith, and that saving faith, like we talked about before, uh, pr produces justification, okay? That saving faith leads to justification because a person is justified by faith alone, okay? So from faith, they are justified. And then justification, we talked about the formula. You know, we talked about comparing the Catholic and the Reform perspective. The Reform perspective, I should just always write it down because I always mess it up. The Reform perspective is justification 
is equal to faith and works. If I remember that right. Did you write it down? Can you just double check me? I always get it, I always get it confused. I stumble on it all the time. Um, but, ju but justification along with, did I do it wrong? Can you correct me? Okay, I had it backwards. Okay, so tell me the other one. Reformed Protestants, justification plus faith. That's it. Yeah, so justific so we have faith, and faith gives, it, you know, is justification, leads to justification. So now that you have faith and justification, you can do good works, which is a right product of justification. And that's what sanctification is. It's the good works that we do uh, to either our neighbor, to God, or to sanctify ourselves. After sanctification, the pers a person is glorified. Um, in a sense, you know, you're, you're raised into glory in heaven. Now, there's, like I said, there's a logical order to this, but it's not, it doesn't necessarily equate temporally. So calling, regeneration, faith, and justification all happen pretty much within an instance. Um, that especially if you were to think, you might be able to separate calling in that God has elected a person's long before they were born, and when they were born, then that might start the process. But we're talking about the effectual calling when they uh, hear the inward call of the gospel and respond to it. From that moment, they, they receive regeneration. So as soon as, a, because remember, God, we talked about God's eternal decrees. I think that was in chapter three or four. When God decrees something, it comes to pass. Let there be light. Light didn't have an option to weigh, you know, do I want to turn on? Do I want to do it? God didn't invite light to turn on. No. God said, let there be light, and there was light. When God says, I'm electing you, you're elected. Boom. That's it. So, when, so once that happens, a person then becomes regenerated. Okay? They receive that, the, the being born again status. And then once, they, once someone's born again, they receive the gift of faith. Remember, faith is not something we do. It's something done to us. And so we receive faith. And faith leads to justification because you can only be justified by faith alone. And so all four of these happen, at least these three, but I would say maybe even all four, happen within a moment. I mean, you, as, soon as, as soon as you hear that effectual call, you're regenerated in the sight of God, you have faith, and you're justified before a holy God. Now, sanctification, that takes a long time. In fact, that takes a lifetime. Sanctification is the, is the long, lifelong process of, of becoming holy. And of course, we recognize that we will never become perfectly holy in this world, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And so that's why there's glorification. And glorification will never happen to any of us until we die. We're all, we will only be glorified in heaven. Um, and so you see how the, the, the temporal aspect of it doesn't line up with everybody. Because some people are going to be called, at, perhaps infectiously called at different points in their life. Uh, but this is the logical order in the sense that this is the way, that's the process. These are the steps that it has to happen in. And so, any questions on that before I begin? Does that sort of make sense? Again, it's a logical order, not a temporal order. Because remember, God is above time. God's beyond time. And when God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen when he says it's going to happen. All right, so the Westminster Confession asserts that regeneration then, so we're talking about regeneration, results in a new heart and a new spirit. That's a quote from there. So this is taken from the, from the scriptures, Psalms 51, verse 10, uh, the great psalm of, uh, of uh, confession by David after Nathan had shown him his, uh, his, his error when he, um, when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and uh, killed her husband. Uh, Psalms 51, verse 10, David cries out in this lament, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So that's what regeneration does. Is, it, is a person, is a, a clean heart is created in that person. Uh, a steadfast, steadfast spirit is renewed in that person at regeneration. John 3, 6, here, Jesus, again, talking to Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. We have to have a new heart that's aligned with the spirit. We have to have a new spirit that's aligned with the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, there's no way that we can truly be regenerated if we're still living in the old way, if we're living in the 
pre-birth way, if you will, the pre-regeneration life. We can't do that. Paul says to Titus in 3 verse 5, he, God saved us by, wash, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So it is the Holy Spirit, again, who does the regenerating work and who does the renewal uh, for us. So that's how we become, uh, we are given this new heart, this regeneration, new life. Uh, we're brought from our, we were dead in our sins and trespasses, and we're brought into new life in Christ. And so we learn one very important thing about regeneration, and I said it before, but I want to stress it one more time. Regeneration is a work of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's his responsibility. Within the Godhead, the system of the Godhead, God, the Holy Spirit, this is his work. This is what he does. He regenerates us. Now, he's not just living. It's not the only thing he does, but regeneration is not something we do, and it's not something that Christ the Son does, or it's not, it's not something God the Father does. It's something that God the Holy Spirit does. The Spirit is the one who regenerates us. But regeneration, as you see, is not the final step in things. In fact, the final step belongs to glorification, but we'll talk more on glorification when we get to chapter 22. For now, the confession continues that those who are regenerated, quote, are further sanctified really and personally. So while sanctification is a work of the Holy Spirit, it is not a monergistic work. Do you remember those two words? I'm going to write them up again. So we had, we talked about this when we talked about um, justification. So that we had monergistic and synergistic. Do you remember what those meant out of curiosity? Mm -hmm. Yep. And so moner a monergistic is, is a, 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 I mean, I was right, a work that is done by a single force. So that's, no, taking out theology, just monergistic is work, because we talked about, you see the word uh, erg in there, that's the Greek word for work, uh, and of course mon, mono. So, the, so there's one force of work there in monergistic. And synergistic, it's work by combined forces. And of course, you know, we talked about the sin. You know, if you have a, you synchronize our watches, we're setting the watches together. So it's working together there. So we talked about that justification is a monergistic work, that God alone does the work of justifying. This is why our good works can't change our justification, can't affect our justification, because it is by it's a monergistic work of God. However, sanctification is a synergistic work. Okay, we are not commanded to sit back passively and do nothing while God makes us holy. You'll never see that anywhere in the scriptures. Rather, what you do see over and over again is a call for believers, for Christians, to participate, to cooperate, to work with the Holy Spirit in the process of sanctification. That's why it's a lifelong process. That's why it doesn't happen in an instant because you and I are working at it. And when people work at things, it takes us a while to break our old habits, right? It's so hard to break our old habits. And we're in, we're in the habits of, of sin and we need to learn how to break that. And that takes a long time. Sometimes that might even take a lifetime. Uh, and indeed, no one will become perfect in this lifetime. So, you know, don't even... Aim for it, but don't ever think you're going to be perfect in this life because we, we can't be. We won't be. As long as we have this fleshly body, we're not going to be perfect. And we'll talk about that in the third article. But again, so sanctification is a synergistic work. So sanctification is both an objective reality and a subjective experience. So it's an objective reality and a subjective. Here's what I mean. It's an objective reality in that it is a work of the Holy Spirit creating in us. So it's a work of the Holy Spirit, meaning it's work of God, God the Spirit, then it is objective. Because what God does is always objective. It's not subjective. It's not based on our feelings. It's not based on our opinions. It's not based on what we read in certain books. What God does is objective. It's real. It's true. And so if God makes us, declares that we're going to be sanctified, we're going to be sanctified. Sanctification is objective. It's going to be an objective reality. But it's also subjective in that 
it is our mortification of sin, that it's our process. So sometimes we're going to feel more sinful or less than sinful, depending on how, you know, we're, how well we're doing at mortifying sin uh, that particular day. Uh, so we're going to struggle. We're, we're going we're gonna to fight. It's going to be hard. And we're going to explain a little bit more in the next article. But that's why it's a subjective experience as well, in that at times we're not going to feel very holy. We're going to feel very sinful. But again, it's an objective reality, and that's where we place our hope. That's where we place our trust and the assurance is in the objectivity and not in our subjective experience. But again, we'll talk about mortification next. Uh, this sanctification, though it is a work of the Holy Spirit, is, quote, through the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection. We learn two things from this one sentence here. One, without Christ's death and resurrection, so without Christ's death and resurrection, there cannot be sanctification. Here's the reason why. Because it is his righteousness that is transferred to us. So when his righteousness is transferred onto our account, as Paul says, it is at that moment that we can then begin uh, being created anew. So we're talking here about sanctification. We can now be quickened. That's another way that sanctification is, we don't use that language, but you know, if you talk about in the old English, uh, something is quickened, something is made alive. We're dead in our trespasses so long as our sins are still in us. But when our sins are transferred onto Christ on the cross and his righteousness is transferred onto us, then we can, we're made alive. We're, we're renewed. We're, we're regenerated Christians in that sense. And so without the death and resurrection, uh, there, his righteousness would never be transferred to us, and therefore we would never be quickened unto sanctification. That's the first thing we learn. The second thing we learn from this is that without Christ's death and resurrection, there cannot be sanctification because it is his ascension that guarantees the promise of the Holy Spirit. Just think about this. If Jesus was never killed, executed, if Jesus was never uh, buried and then resurrected and never ascended into heaven, if he never did any of those things, then he would never have sent us the Holy Spirit. He wouldn't, have, he wouldn't have had to, he wouldn't have had the chance, whatever reason, but we know that when Christ ascended in chapter 2 of Acts, he says, I'm going to be departing from you, don't worry, don't freak out disciples, because I'm going to leave you a helper. And who is that helper? That helper is the Holy Spirit. And so we need Christ's death and resurrection, and ascension I include on that, because otherwise we would not have the Holy Spirit here with us. He would not have sent the Holy Spirit if he did not ascend into heaven. So that's the two things we sort of learn here. Again, Titus chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, Paul helps us understand this. Uh, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out. So that's so the Holy Spirit is poured out on us by God, by Jesus, by the, the Godhead. This is the Holy Spirit is sent and given to us. And so the Holy Spirit whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. And so this is why, if you ever remember that, if you ever repeat the Nicene Creed, we talk about in that creed, we don't say it often enough, so I don't have it quite memorized. But when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we say the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. We're talking about the Trinitarian. Uh, definitions, you know, God, Son is only begotten, but the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. This is one of those, those key verses that God the Father, through God the Son, sends, pours out, gives to us God the Holy Spirit. And again, that's necessary for our sanctification. Now, sanctification isn't just through the virtue of Christ alone, but also by his word and spirit dwelling in them, dwelling in uh, so his work is important, but it, it doesn't actually stop there. It doesn't stop at just his work, but is included his word and, uh, and his spirit dwelling in us. Second Thessalonians gives us a hint, chapter 2, verse 13. Paul says, we should always give thanks to God for you. So he's talking to the Thessalonians. For you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. And so we see here that um, what, what we're talking about here, the word and the spirit uh, dwelling in there. So sanctification by the spirit and faith in the truth. Where do we find that truth? Yes. It's not just any truth, but true truth, biblical truth. 
Jesus praying for the elect in the great high priestly prayer, John 17, he asked God to sanctify them in the truth. And he doesn't stop there. He, he defines what that truth is. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And so that's how we recognize. So both the spirit and the word sanctify us. So one, the Holy Spirit initiates this sanctification in us. And the other, the word, helps us in the continuation of sanctification. How do we know how to be holy? You know, if, if we didn't have a rule book, if we didn't have a playbook, we might define holiness however we want. Eating a million cookies makes me holy. It makes me fat. That's what it does. But that's what we would do. If, if, if we did, it would be whatever makes us happy, we would say, oh, that makes me holy. But no, thanks be to God, he's given to us objective truth and his command as to what holiness is, what holiness looks like, what sanctification is. Now, we'll talk about that a little bit later. For now, I want to finish up this article. The work of sanctification is that, quote, the dominion of sin is destroyed. So that's, that's what sanctification does in us, is it destroys the dominion of sin. So sin has such a grip on the human race that there is no way, no way that we'd be able to go into heaven without something stopping, you know, without something cutting off that bondage, without something stopping, you know, releasing those chains. Uh, of course, because God is holy and perfect and righteous, and we sinful, unrighteous things can't exist in his presence. Uh, Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 5, verse 19. He says, for as through the one man's disobedience, so talking about Adam, through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So the, the human race was made sinners. Even so, through the obedience of the one, talking about Christ, the many will be made righteous. The church will be made righteous because the church is made up of people who are unregenerate, who, who come from the world, who come from sinners. And so the only way that we can be made righteous is if we are perfectly sanctified. Okay? Uh, Paul Thankfully, you know, our sins are crucified with Christ. That's how we, we become sanctified in that. So how, that's how we come become righteous, I mean. Romans chapter 6, verse 6, our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Remember, sin has such a grip on us. We're slaves to sin. We're, we're held in bondage to sin. And someone needs to come and break that bondage. And of course, that someone is Christ. And sanctification then is the process of doing away with that body of sin, you know, in order that your body of sin might be done away with. Um, and the reason sin's dominion is destroyed is because the sanctified are no longer of the flesh, but of the spirit. So we've been purchased from our life in the spirit, spirit by Christ's uh, death and resurrection into, uh, into the new life in the spirit. I meant to say flesh the first time. So we're purchased, we're purchased, we're redeemed from the life in the flesh into the life in the spirit. Romans 8, verse 9. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So no longer are we slaves to sin, but now we are, we're slaves to righteousness, as Paul says elsewhere. We're able to work out our faith in fear and trembling, Okay. So though the dominion of sin is destroyed, however, the confession states that the several lusts thereof remain, but are more and more weakened and mortified. And we're going to talk about that in the next article, so I'm going to stop with that. Uh, but quite wonderfully, quote, the, they also, the sanctified, the justified, are more and more quickened and strengthened in all saving graces. We'll talk about that in the final article. So finally, with this article... It is the practice of true holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. This is, this is a key phrase to understanding this first article here. That only holy people will see God. Okay? Don't ever think that unholy people are going to see God. No, no. Only holy people will see God. 1 Peter 1, verses 15 through 16. Like the Holy One, talking about God, who called you, and we're always talking about that, you hear that over and over again. The Holy One who called you, Peter tells us, be holy yourselves, also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. 
God never negotiates his righteousness. God never grades on a curve. God's righteousness, because God is immutable, his righteousness is immutable. He will never lower the bar just for us. His bar is set and it's steadfast. And that bar is holy perfection. Jesus even says as much. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8 in the Beatitudes. We love the Beatitudes, but if we really think about it, it's you know, kind of stark uh, conversation that Jesus has. He said, blessed, oh, we love that, blessed. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You will only see God if you are pure in heart. Now raise your hand if you're pure in heart. <laughs> we know that no one is holy. We, we know that no one is holy. Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 10 tells us, Are we better than they, talking about the Gentiles? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin, says Paul, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. So this is, so we recognize that there's clearly some disconnect there. There's no way that we who are perfectly unrighteous can become perfectly holy without something happening to us. And so this is the reason why, this is, this is what's of great importance. It is Jesus sending the Holy Spirit through the Holy Spirit who makes us holy. Romans 6, 22, 23. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification. So the benefit is sanctification. And the outcome of that is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I cannot stress enough that sanctification is a synergistic work. And the next article is going to explain why. But we have to recognize that God is doing something, that God initiates it, that is the Holy Spirit who starts it. And once the Holy Spirit starts the process of sanctification, then we get to come in and, and cooperate and help, and we'll see that. But before we begin, are there any questions on this first article? Uh-huh. No, but certainly, uh, and so here's the thing, and this we'll talk about it here. Uh, it's not going to happen in this lifetime, but it's something we need to aim for. And that's, and that's the thing we have to remember is just because it's not going to happen in the here and now, and it'll never happen before we die, that doesn't mean we give up. And we're going to talk about that in the second article here. But that's our goal. That's our aim. And the reason why is we talked about this. I know I've mentioned several different places. Um, you know, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. We love God. If we really love God, if that love is really there, we want to obey him. Right? I mean, children, if they love their parents, which many of them do, generally they'll, they'll obey them to some extent. You know, children are still fallen. But, the, you know, take that example. You know, I, I just always think of like Teddy. If, you know, I, I know he loves me and I love him. And, you know, sometimes he'll fuss at me. But if I ask him to pick up something, he'll bring it. You know, it's, it's, it, that's a little example. But if we love God, who's our Heavenly Father, then we're, we're, natu- we're going to want to obey him. We're going to want to please him. Which, of course, doing things that obey God, or obeying God, doing things that are pleasing to him, that's part of sanctification. Because that's our goal. That's our aim. We'll never hit it, but we got to aim for it. Yeah. Sometimes real often if we're together for a meal and getting ready to say the blessing, she'll say, is your heart right? <laughs> ah, she loves me so much. That's funny. I like it. <laughs> All right. The second article says, this sanctification is throughout in the whole man, yet imperfect in this life. There abiding still some remnants of corruption in every part. Whence ariseth a continual an irreconcilable war, the flesh lusting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. So here I've titled this article, The Irreconcilable War. So first of all, sanctification is throughout. We have to recognize that the confession says that. There is no, there's not a part of us that is missing in sanctification. Okay, sanctification involves the whole body, the whole self. 
There isn't any aspect of us that is not being sanctified, or is, that we can say, oh, I don't need to sanctify that part because no one's going to see that. No, the sanctification involves the whole person, the whole self enjoins in this process. And we talked about this past Sunday that Jesus says the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your straight strength. This is a, a comprehensive, holistic love of God, and it's manifested in and it's uh, sharpened through this comprehensive and holistic sanctification. How do we love God with our whole selves? We sanctify our whole selves. The whole self is sanctified. Mind, body, strength, spirit. Not a part of it is left out of sanctification. Indeed, it is this comprehensive holiness that is prayed for and commanded by the Apostle Paul to the church in Thessalonica, where he says, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. You know, not sanctify your spirit, not sanctify your mind, no. Sanctify you entirely. And he goes on to explain, may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's from 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. And so we see that sanctification includes the whole self. There's not one part of us that is not going to be sanctified or doesn't need sanctification. Everything of us needs sanctification. Nevertheless, the fullness of sanctification, the confession says, is imperfect in this life. So though there is no part of us that is excluded from sanctification, there is still much sin in us that remains of our corruption. Now, when we hear the word corruption, I know every time I say this word, I always think of Jean because she always, she has this funny look on her face when I say, you know, corruption, you're talking about people. Uh, whenever we hear the word corruption, we often think of something that is utterly destroyed, that there's, there's no good in it. It's been, it's been totally depraved, to use another phrase. Uh, you know, in, in a more modern sense, uh, a corrupted computer hard drive or a computer file that's been corrupted, it's one that's become accept, inaccessible and therefore useless. So I have a little disk that's been corrupted. And no matter how many times I put it in my computer, it won't read it. And so now I have this disk that I spent money on, and it's now absolutely useless because it won't, it won't be read. That's, it's been corrupted. So that's usually what we think of when we say the word corruption. However, corruption also conveys this notion of, of departing from the original, uh, you know, some, so departing from the pure beginning. So in that sense, so in this sense that something that is corrupted is something that is no longer like its original design and purpose. It has changed. And it hasn't changed for the better. It's changed for the worse, but it's changed. It's not totally useless. It's been changed. And so, for instance, a document might become corrupted if someone alters the text. You know, or, you know, if you think about um, whenever the government sends out those, you know, they, they what is it, they, uh, I forgot the right word, but when they make documents unseek, declassify, when they declassify information, they still redact that, you know, you see, you'll still see some black lines cutting out things. That text has now become corrupted in the sense that, you know, it's no longer like the original. We, we can't know exactly what that declassified document said because they blacked out certain information. So in the sense that that's been corrupted, it's not useless. It's still useful. People love reading declassified information, but it's not the original document that many would prefer. And so that's the type of way we need to think about corruption when it's in us. So sin's corruption remains in us, even in justified people. 1 John 1.10 states very clearly, if we say, again, he's talking to Christians. John is writing to the church. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So even John and, and others recognize that sin is still within justified believers. Isaiah 53, verse 6, talking about, so this is the great uh, messianic uh, prophecy, talking about what Jesus, the Messiah, is going to do. And in verse 6, it says, All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And back to Psalms 51, verse 5, there again, David, in confession, he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin, my mother conceived me. He even recognized that that sin was there even before he was born. When he was conceived in his mother's womb, that sin's corruption was already present in his life. And so this presence of sin causes an irreconcilable war between our two natures, between flesh and flesh and spirit. 
And Paul elaborates this on Romans chapter 7. I do want to read it uh, in some big chunks, but we we'll, won't spend too much time. So Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 15, he says, For we, excuse me, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. So first of all, we have to recognize that Paul is talking about Christians here. He's not, some people say he's talking about his pre-converted life. A lot of the language in the Greek is it's present tense. He's talking about what's happening in, in his present life. Um, and so what Paul's saying is that, that Christians recognize that the law is good, that the law teaches us things, that the law is designed for good, yet it is a spiritual thing in the sense that it is good for our spirit. And so Paul says that he delights in the law. He wants to practice the law, though in the flesh he's doing the very thing he hates. This is why, again, he's talking to Christians, believers. A non-believer would never delight in the law. They would see the law and, be, and say, oh, why does God demand all this nonsense? No, he's talking to believers who delight in the law. Paul delights in the law. Yet, even though he wants to practice the law, his flesh, in the flesh, he's doing the thing that he hates, which is not doing the law, which is disobeying the law. And so our sin nature vehemently and continually opposes the renewed life given through the Spirit. That's sin's corruption in our flesh, in our being. The sin wants to push back against this new life, this regeneration that has been given to us by God. The flesh says, oh, why do you want to tie yourself to him? Why are you going to listen to all his rules? Why do you want to make him happy? Why don't you go do what makes you happy? We hear that too often. That's, that's what sin is telling us. That's what our flesh is telling us. So we're at war. There's tension between that. Because on the one hand, we want to do what makes us happy. But if we're believers, we also want to do what makes God happy. And of course, for Paul and for all believers, the priority needs to be what makes God happy. Because what makes God happy ultimately makes us happy. When we do things that are pleasing to God, we find enjoyment in it. And so Paul here is, it's he, he's saying that if, if this is so frustrating even for himself, this is the Apostle Paul, probably the, the, the best Christian out there second to Jesus himself. You know, if, this, if Paul is struggling with this, then you better believe that you and I will also find this quite a struggle. None of us here would ever be able to hold a light to the Apostle Paul. And yet even he recognizes that he is struggling with this. We too will struggle with it. Perhaps you're even doing it right now. Verse 23, he continues. I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. So again, Paul, a regenerated Christian, he's a born again Christian. He's able to recognize and distinguish the things between the things of the spirit and the things of the flesh. He's able to see it. He's able to recognize it. The unregenerate person, the person who's not a believer, the person who's not born again, is not able to draw those distinctions, but rather continues to wallow in his sin, thinking that he's living his best life now. Heard things like that? Live your best life now? That's what, that, and that's what, the, and honestly, the sinner is doing it. He's living his best life now because in all eternity, he's going to be in hell. And so here we see that the unregenerate person cannot wrestle with this in the way that Paul is doing. This again, this is the reason why Paul is talking to Christians uh, and knowing that we're going to be struggling with it. The born again Christian understands that the law, which is good and is divine, the law is a very good thing. The law was given to us by God. But the Christian recognizes that the law only provokes, only exposes, and only condemns our sin without actually delivering it, delivering us from it. So no matter how hard we might try and keep the law, what do we talk about? 
No one is made righteous by works. No one is made righteous by works of the law. Paul says that several times. So, we, so what the law does is all it does is it, it shows us that we're sinners, and it provokes us, and it condemns us. And so what, what next? If it can't deliver us, what does? So Paul, finally and thankfully, he exclaims in the next chapter, Romans chapter 8, the answer. He says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. So the law, the law, the condemning work of the law, there's not, that's not present for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. And so we see here that Paul recognizes that we're struggling, but the Christian rightly recognizes that it is through Christ that his redemption comes. It is through Christ that we're able to have the spirit of life and no longer the spirit of death. Though Christians are at war with our sin nature, we have now this assurance that the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set us free from the law of the spirit of death. So this is why I said, going back, that sanctification is both an objective reality, but it's also a subjective experience. It's objective in that sanctification happens to those who are justified. That is an objective reality. That is a truth. That's what happens. But it's an experience in that we're cooperating with it, we're struggling with it, and like Paul, we get frustrated when we don't do it right. But we have the assurance of the former. We have the assurance of the objective reality, and that's what gets us through. And so when we look at the law, no longer do we see some insurmountable, you know, even just look at the Ten Commandments. If you were to try to scale that, complete all Ten Commandments, we'd be like trying to climb Mount Everest, climb the Matterhorn, climb off you know, every mountain in the world 10 times over. It'd be a struggle. It's insurmountable when we look at the law that way. But when we look at the law in Christ, through Christ, we see that the righteousness of Christ, that he kept that law perfectly, has been imputed to us, has been given to the believer. And this is what gives us the strength to mortify our flesh, which is the next article. So I'm just going to read since we're running out of time. So Article 3, in which war, so talking about that war between the flesh and spirit, in which war, although the remaining corruption for a time may much prevail, yet through the continual supply of strength from the sanctifying spirit of Christ, the regeneration part doth overcome. And so the saints grow in grace, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So there is a right reason that the struggle between flesh and spirit is called warfare. Warfare is tough. It's nasty. It's hard. No one wants to go to war. And those who have been in war come back changed. War is a, a terrifying, terrible thing. And, and Paul uses this language very specifically. In other places, he's talks, he uses athletic language. You know, he uses that language uh, very often to describe uh, discipline and things like that. But he doesn't use the athletic language here because the striving of the athlete pales in comparison to the struggle of the soldier, especially in the first century. You know, we have a, a different view of war, but in Paul's mind, when he talks about war, he's talking about guys on a battlefield with swords slashing at each other, hacking at each other, blood and nastiness flying around everywhere. That's what Paul has in mind when he says warfare. And that's why that image is, is a better image for this than his other common one, which again is athletes, you know, striving, running the race, um, being, you know, building up endurance, all those things. Those are great. It's a great imagery, but that is a weak image for what the struggle between flesh and spirit is. That's, it's a warfare. It is war. Indeed, Paul makes very clear that the, the lengths that we are to go, this is the other reason why it's called warfare when it comes to, to this. If you are living according to the flesh, you must die. Where is death most common? In warfare. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. This is why he uses, he has to use the language of warfare. 
because this is, it's a life or death situation. It's not just winning the prize. It's not just being a champion. No, it is life or death. That's what's on the line here. And that's why it's warfare. And this is, re this is the reason why this doctrine is known as the doctrine of mortification, the putting to death or mortifying the sins that are within us. John Owen, who I encourage you to, to read. I, I listened to this book on audiobook. He wrote the book on the mortification of sin. He was an uh, early Puritan, and he wrote this. And in that book, he rightly argues, he says, be killing sin or it will be killing you. And he says a whole bunch of other stuff. It's a great, a great book. You should read it. Paul elsewhere says that God has instructed us to deny ungodliness and worldly denier. D excuse me. Deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, in the here and now. Right now, you're to, to live sensibly, righteously, and godly, denying ungodliness and worldly desires. That's from Titus chapter 2, verse 12. Again, he says, you, talking to Christians, talking to the church in Colossae, you laid aside the old self with its old practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. That's Colossians 3, 9 through 10. Paul's language is very clear. We must discard, take off. We must deny the old ways of sin. So they're constantly in us. It's a struggle, but we have to discard it. We have to deny it. We have to turn from it. And this is a process, and it's a practice of sanctification. That's what we're doing here, is we're discarding and denying sin's power in our lives. And only we can do it. You know, I mean, we can get help, but again, it's not, it's not a monergistic work. It's a synergistic work. We have to do it together. And so the only way that this is possible, because again, it's a struggle, the confession says, is through the continual supply of strength from the sanctifying spirit. I stated earlier in uh, the first article that the justified are more and more quickened and strengthened in all saving graces. So this, is, this article is picking up on that sentence there. So what are these saving graces that are provided, that provide the strength for sanctification? Well, I think there's many, but Paul, I think, gives us a, a good summary, and it's probably the most famous, and it's his famous trifecta of faith, hope, and love. I think there's more, but I think these three are the pinnacle of, uh, of the saving graces. Uh, here we see that um, uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.3 is just an example. Paul gives thanks for the Thessalonians, their work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope. These three help us in perfecting holiness in the fear of God, as the confession says. So 1 John 5, verse 4, whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And so we see how faith is a saving grace. Faith, excuse me, faith, it helps us to recognize that this present world, we have, a, we have victory over it. It's been overcome. Faith reveals that sin no longer has a hold on us, but rather the victory has come through Christ, that whoever is born of God overcomes the world. That's how faith is a saving grace. Ephesians 4, 15, Paul says, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Speaking the truth, whose truth? God's truth, the word. And we speak it in love, in sacrifice, in compassion, in caring, in, in devotion, devotion to God, devotion to our neighbor. We do this because we are growing up in all aspects as Christ our head. And he, of course, is the represent, he represents love in so many ways. He loves God perfectly. He is the object of God's perfect love. He is the example of what love looks like. And so we see that if we want to love, as I mentioned this past Sunday, if we want to love as God demands, we love Christ and we love as Christ loves. 
So that's the second saving grace. And the third we get from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. There the apostle says, this hope, there's the word hope, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Hope is an anchor of the soul. I love that language there. A hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us. So we, hope is such a great and powerful saving grace because we're hoping in Christ. We hope in what he has done in his work. And guess what? He entered into the Holy of Holies and he has brought God to us. He is our mediator. We can now have access to God through Christ. And that is where we place our hope. So that's the third saving grace. I said there are more, but I, I think those are the, the three ones. And we're at, at our time. So let me just conclude with this one uh, one remark. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13, Paul says this, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is the heart of the doctrine of sanctification. Now, people who disagree with the Reformed theology point to this and say, look, God says work out your salvation, so do good works. They misunderstand that in this whole passage, Paul's talking about the comprehensive, the plan of sound salvation, the whole thing. And so sanctification, the lifelong process, is what Paul has in mind here. And so the whole doctrine uh, the, is the heart of, sorry, this is the heart of the whole doctrine of sanctification, that believers are called to work that language is labor, is toil at our sanctification. It's a struggle, as I mentioned before, as Paul has mentioned himself. But believers do so with fear and trembling, not in terror, because, again, the justified don't actually have to fear God in that sense. We should still fear God, but we don't have to be afraid of his condemnation. So what, what is Paul saying here? Those who, who do it in fear and trembling not in terror, but in reverence to God, recognizing that he is both just and the justifier, knowing that this sanctification is a process that he has initiated in us. And so we reverently, respectfully continue and work and cooperate in that process. And thankfully, there is a consolation that Paul also gives us in this verse. Many people just say, work out your salvation in fear and trembling, and they stop it there. They don't read the next verse. The next verse gives us some deep, deep and wonderful hope that we are not left alone to do this, but it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work. Now, that's an important distinction. God not only gives us the ability, the work, you know, the, the, that we can do it, God certainly gives us that, but God also gives us the will to do it. This is the distinction. This is why uh, so many people struggle with the doctrine of predestination, the doctrine of election. Because what happens in there, what people think happens is that God is forcing us to, to be good, to do things that we don't want to do. But no. Paul makes very clear that it is God who does both the work and the will. So God, through the Holy Spirit, changes our will. And now we're not doing things against our will because God has given us a will that aligns with his. The Holy Spirit has aligned our will with God so that we want to do what is pleasing to him, that we want to pursue holiness. And that it's, no, uh, it, it's not a, a, against our will and it's not against our way because we now have a new way and a new will because it's been renewed through the Spirit of Christ. And so God's sovereign work of sanctification is manifested in the wills of believers when they align with his work. And of course, it's the Holy Spirit who makes that happen. Any questions on anything? All right, well, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for developing this, this plan of, of redemption, this economy of redemption that you've set in place from eternity past. 
And you've revealed to us, uh, revealed it to us through Scripture. Lord, we are, we're grateful because now we can understand, we can get a glimpse into your mind, into what you would have us to do and what it is that you are doing. And so, God, as we continue to, to digest and dwell upon the doctrine of sanctification, may we remember that you invite us, you call us, you, you command us to work with you in this process. As we strive and struggle with the sin that is present in our life, Lord, I ask that the Holy Spirit give each of us the strength by the saving graces to continue to press on and mortify that sin. Lord, each of us is at a different stage in that. But Lord, we also know that we are here to support one another. And so God, I ask that you highlight, that you make known uh, those who are strong in their faith, mature in their faith, those who've been struggling for a long time, make them known so that those who are new, those who are struggling harder, or those who just don't understand, can also grow in their faith and become mature. Lord, we just pray that you show us ways that we can indeed do the good works that you ask us to do. We pray all this in the name of Christ, our Savior.